All right, so on with the show. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, since it's very fair to say pretty much he has pretty much invented many of the concepts that are used in almost all modern database systems. Professor Mike Stonebreaker has been a pioneer database researcher for more than 40 years. He is currently a professor at MIT CSAIL, and early in his career, he developed well-known relational database management systems such as Ingress and Postgres. I still use that daily, and I'm sure many of you still do. And also, where he's at MIT now, he's developed more novel data management techniques such as CStore, HStore, and SciDB. I always tell people I never trust a data scientist who doesn't know SQL. And you can disagree with me on that, but you know, if you're going to do data wrangling, SQL is still a great tool for it. Also, yeah, right? <laughs> you guys don't agree with me? Not hiring you. <laughs> Not hiring you. And Dr. Stonebreaker has also been very successful as an entrepreneur and founder. He's got an incredible array of um, successful database companies. I'm sure you've heard of many of them and probably didn't notice, but Ingress, Illustra, Paradigm 4, Steam-based systems, Vertica, VoltDB, and most recently, Tamer. And to cap it all off, he has won the AM Turning Award Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Mike Stonebreaker to the stage. Thank you, Seamus. By, by the way, you can tell there's a clear way to tell a marketing person. They wear a, they wear a coat and usually a tie. Uh, so I don't wear coats and ties. I actually own one, but you won't get to see it. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I just want to note one quick thing. You're looking at the slide now. Uh, there is no, <clears throat> no organization at MIT called SAIL. Uh, data errors we'll talk about in a bit, but you're looking at one uh, quick one. Okay, what, what I want to do is tell you the top 10 blunders uh, when people talk about big data. And, and the message is going to be, if you work for a company that does even one of these, uh, switch companies. And of course, with apologies to David Letterman. OK, so what's blunder number one? Uh, over maybe a decade or maybe two decades, your company is going to move essentially everything to the cloud. Now, Tamer Marketing came up with this graphic, and I have no idea what it means, but it's supposed to be a marketing person's rendition of the cloud. So why are you going to move everything to the cloud? Well, I can just give you one quick vignette. Uh, Azure data centers right now, uh, they are shipping containers. Uh, they are sealed. All that goes in is power, internet, and chilled water. They are in parking lots, roof and walls optional. They're only there if they need it for security. And if your data center is on raised flooring in Cambridge, clearly you can't compete. So you're going to move there because of cost, because of elasticity. So you're going to move everything to the cloud over time. Now you guys are all going to say, yeah, but I have all kinds of objections to that. First objection is usually security. Uh, my, you know, I have my company jewels, and I'm not willing to entrust them to the big cloud guys. Uh, chances are your security in-house is worse than the cloud guy's security. So uh, you, you may think that you have better security, but I bet you that you don't. Uh, some people object that uh, the cloud is not going to be cheaper. Uh, and if you consider all costs, uh, chances are that's not true. You're probably cheating if you think you're cheaper. And notice that uh, if your CEO doesn't, doesn't agree with uh, what I'm talking about, then uh, wait for the 11th of these 10 blunders. 
Second blunder uh, is I talked to you know, an executive at a, at a large e-tailer uh, yesterday. He said, I am drowning in data. I've got all the data you can ever imagine, and I don't have any machine learning expertise to help manage it. So ML is getting a lot better, uh, and it's going to be very disruptive. All you have to do is think autonomous vehicles, uh, think automatic checkout, think drone delivery. Uh, it's going to be very disruptive. So in my opinion, most of you work for companies <clears throat> and you have a choice. You can either be a disruptor or you can get disrupted. So you can either work for a taxi company or you can work for Uber. Uh, well, this will come up again. So what do you do? Uh, the answer is, you know, as Seamus says, as, you know, SQL is table stakes. Uh, what you're going to need is some ML expertise. They're expensive. They're in short supply. You're going to have to just pay up. So get going on the coming arms race and pay up for talent. And of course, your HR folks are not going to want to do this, but this, you know, the, this statement about aggressive companies is they're willing to do what it takes uh, to make sure to, to avoid blunder number two. Uh, more generally, blunder number three, uh, in the coming world, uh, you're going to need a few rocket scientists because uh, these various, what to do about these various blunders you know, may be complicated and take a lot of technical expertise. Uh, I'm always amazed uh, that I talk to senior, senior techies at various enterprises and a lot of them aren't very good. So they will be your guiding light to avoid uh, these blunders, pay up to get, a, to get a few of them to help you out in dealing with this stuff. And of course, senior techies don't wear coats and ties, you know, they're weird. Uh, please uh, move to a culture that's accepting of them so you don't drive them away. Here's my favorite one. Uh, all of you say, I'm serious about data science, I have SQL, I have, uh, you know, I know about parallelism, I know about big data. And if you don't use the word uh, data integration in those words, uh, you're making a huge blunder. I've talked to a lot of data scientists and my first question to them is, what fraction of your time do you spend Getting, finding the data you want to analyze and then putting it together and cleaning it. Uh, I usually hear 90% or more. So a typical data scientist spends four and a half days a week doing what you would call mung work and half a day a week or less uh, doing uh, real an analysis. I talked to the uh, a senior uh, techie at iRobot, the guys that have the vacuum cleaners that run around your floor. And she said, I spend 90% of my time finding the data I want to analyze and cleaning it and, and integrating it. Of the remaining 10% of my time, I spend 90% fixing my cleaning errors. So she spends 99% of her time on data integration, data cleaning, data discovery. None of that is stuff that you would call data science, but that's the high pole in the tent. So you've got to solve your real data science problem, which is making your data scientists productive. So without, without clean data, uh, machine learning is worthless, data science is worthless. So obviously anybody, you know, you've got to get in, you've got to put in place a strategy to deal with the 90%. So the strategy to deal with the 
is less important. But that's probably what you're spending most of your time doing. So move to solving your real data science problem. Okay, blunder number five. I hear this all the time. I have a big data problem. I have a big data integration problem. And extract, transform, and load is going to solve it. Or I hear uh, master data management is going to solve it. So blunder number five is belief that this 20-year-old technology is going to solve uh, your data integration problem. So let's look at each of these in turn. So what's, each, what's extract, transform, and load all about? You decide in advance what data sources to integrate. God tells you, meaning your uh, chief data officer. You build a global data model up front with a rocket scientist. And that data model is then handed to uh, engineers who go out and for each data source, uh, figure out how to convert the local data into the global data and do data cleaning uh, at the, you know, while you're doing it. So uh, I talk to lots of people who do this. This is typically in front of a data warehouse. And I ask, how many data sources are you integrating using ETL? I have never heard a number greater than 20. So if you're, if you're integrating 20 data sources, have at it with ETL. Uh, and why don't, why don't people use this technology to integrate 1,000 data sources? Because the answer is it's too human intensive, it's too expensive. So that's problem number one. The technology has too much manual uh, intervention. Second thing is I've never seen anybody build a global data model at scale, meaning covering more than a very small fraction of your enterprise data. <clears throat> and you guys all tried this 20, 20 years ago, and it all failed. And it failed because it took you two years to do it, and by the time you had finished with this global data model, it was two years out of date, and it was wrong. So this all failed. Learn from your, expense, from your mistakes of the past. <clears throat> and of course, what about 20 data sources? Well, Merck is my favorite example. That's a big drug company. They have 4,000 plus or minus Oracle databases. They don't know exactly how many they have. They have a data lake on top of that. They have countless files. Uh, they have countless sort of small individual things, like the CFO probably does his budget with a local spreadsheet. And then they also want to integrate data off the web. So you look at that, and he looks at that and says ETL is a non-starter. So ETL is great if you want to take 20 customer-facing data sources or less and put it in a data warehouse, but most people I know have a much bigger data integration problem than that. What about master data management, second thing, second traditional technology uh, that's typically run? So the problem with ETL is you load everything into a common place, but you got to remove duplicates. And how do, you, how do you remove duplicates? In master data management, you use something called match merge, which is MDM systems suggest that to remove duplicates, you have a rule system. Two entities are the same, for example, if they have the same address. And then once you figure out what the duplicate entities are, you have to have merge rules to figure out how to put together the various the things that are the same entity into what's called a golden record. Problem with this technology is it doesn't scale. So scalability is, is, the, is the Achilles heel of all the traditional technology. Just for example, uh, GE uh, had a classification problem. GE, the guys with the headquarters 
right down there. Uh, they wanted to classify 20 million spend transactions. So a spend transaction is I took a taxi over here and I put it on my expense account. So I had 20 million of them over some time period and they have a classification hierarchy of what to, how to allocate spend into various buckets. And you know, there's all spend and then there's travel and underneath travel there's airplane tickets, all that kind of stuff. So they have a static classification hierarchy and 20 million transactions to put into that classification hierarchy. So you can say this sounds like a big data problem, but the biggest problem is that constructing these rules. So they had an expert uh, and she wrote 500 rules. You know, if, if the transaction is from Staples, chances are it's office supplies, those kind of rules. So she had 500 of them and 500 rules is about the most any human can can, can grok. So, you know, tattoo that on your brain. If it's more than 500 rules, chances are it's not going to work. So her 500 rules classified 10% of the spend. She got 2 million records out of 20 million. That isn't very useful. What about the remaining 18 million? So MDM doesn't scale, ETL doesn't scale. If you have a small problem, by all means, have at it. If you've got a, a big problem, it's not going to work. So what do you do instead? Well, they called in Tamer. Tamer used their uh, two million records as training data for a machine learning model. And the machine learning model classified the remaining 18 million and it worked darn well. So what to do is you've got to apply ML to these kind of problems. Nothing else is going to scale. Okay, blunder number six. You guys, and this, this is pretty much a blunder that none of you are uh, succumbing to, but 15 years ago, your, uh, your CEO would say, I'm, I'm spending a lot of money, I'm building an enterprise data warehouse that's going to solve all my problems. And, you know, data warehouses are great. You, your companies have all used them, and you typically use them for customer-facing structured data from a few data sources. And it works like a charm if that's what you use it for. But if you're trying to do a classification problem, like GE just had, your warehouse isn't going to help. It's not going to help with text, images, video, all the new stuff. So use the technology for what it's good for, which is pretty much what you guys are doing, and don't try and bend your warehouse to do unnatural acts. And while you're at it, remember that you are going to move your data warehouse to the cloud. That's one of the things that's going to go to the cloud. Remember blunder number one. So remember that's in your future. And by the way, there are a bunch of warehouse vendors who, who are, uh, have a guided tour through your wallet with high prices. So while you're at the, in the process of moving stuff to the web, get rid of the high price spread. Okay, I hear lots of times a belief, well, I'm using Hadoop and Spark and that's going to solve all my problems. And that's simply not, well, it's not true for a bunch of reasons. First one is Hadoop and Spark are not very good at anything. If you're using Spark SQL, Spark SQL is simply not competitive against other parallel SQL systems. We've done a bunch of benchmarking. It's simply not very good at doing SQL. Spark streaming, if you can use, if, if 20 second latency is okay with you, Spark streaming will work, but otherwise move to something else like Kafka. So my point of view is to be competitive in the coming technology arms race, 
my opinion is you're, you're better off using best of breed technology in order to win and not lowest common denominator. And for sure, the stuff, your secret sauce on which the success of your company depends, make sure you apply the best technology and that's simply not Hadoop and Spark. Also, remember your big problem, which is data integration, back a couple of blunders ago. So your data scientists are spending 90 plus percent of their time doing something other than running uh, Spark or Hadoop. And Spark and Hadoop have nothing to do with data cleaning. So figure out how to, how to avoid, uh, how, figure out how to fix your 90% problem, not your 10% problem. So Spark and Hadoop are useful, useless on blunders four and five. So focus on blunders four and five uh, and Spark is not the answer to any of that stuff. Okay. Lately, I've heard everybody say, I've got a data lake, and that's going to solve all my problems. So you've drink the Cloudera Kool-Aid, and they say, just put all your stuff in a data lake, and, your li and life will be wonderful. So that's the conventional wisdom, and you'll be able to correlate all your data, your data scientists will be happy, life will be terrific. It's simply not true. And tattoo this on your brain. If you don't learn anything else from this talk, remember this one thing. Independently constructed databases are never plug compatible. Absolutely never. So if you just put it in a data lake, that doesn't help because this, the data sets that are in your lake are simply not plug compatible. Why are they not plug compatible, you might ask? Well, there's all kinds of reasons. First of all, the schemas for your data sets are not, don't match. So you call it salary, I call it wages. The units don't match. Uh, you use euros, I use dollars. Semantics of the various columns don't match. If you're the HR person uh, in Paris, I'm the HR person in New York. You have employees, I have employees. You have salaries, I have salaries. Your salaries are net after taxes in euros and include a lunch allowance. My uh, salaries are gross before taxes, no lunch allowance. So the semantics don't match. And so you can't just put this stuff together. Often the time granularity doesn't match. You have annual data, I have monthly data. Biggest problem is data, all data is dirty. Figure at least 10% of your data is wrong. So minus 99 means maybe null, maybe something else. Null might mean the data is missing and it should be there or the data is not allowed and it can't be there. And so you have to clean your data. And you know, the cleaning data is tough and expensive. But if you don't do it, you have garbage and then when you uh, have your data scientists go at it, they're gonna produce garbage. My favorite example is there's a Tamer customer who's, who used data science on his data lake and said, I have 200,000 customers. Well, after Tamer removed the duplicates, they had 120,000 customers. CEO wants to know the difference between 200,000 and 120,000. So you've got to remove the duplicates. First of all, that's partly a cleaning problem. And mostly there aren't any, there aren't no one thought to have universal uh, IDs, universal keys. So there's no key that can match all this data. You've got to match it on all the other stuff. You know, and I'm Mike Stonebreaker in one data set. I'm MR Stonebreaker. Notice the misspelling of my last name. Uh, you've got to figure out that those are the same entity or they're different entities. 
And so that's all the reasons why the stuff in your data lake is simply a data swamp. So you don't have a data lake, you have a data swamp. And this, you need a curation system to do all the stuff on the previous two slides. So uh, that's going to be a huge problem. And this is what the iRobot lady spends all of her time dealing with. And it's really important. And the traditional technology is very likely to fail. So don't say ETL and MDM are the answer. So this is an 800 pound gorilla staring at you. Uh, put your best people on it because this is the real data science problem, the 90%, the high pole in the tent. Now you might say I have an in-house, uh, I have an in-house system that does all this stuff. Chances are it's crap. Uh, and so chances are it's the thing that produced 200,000 records when the real answer is like 120,000. So you put your best people on this issue and use the best technology because that's going to be the difference between winning and losing, between empowering your data scientists to spend time doing data science and not empowering them. Okay, blunder number nine. I hear this all the time. Uh, I don't have the, you know, my, in a typical enterprise, I spend 95% 95, 95 of my IT uh, budget just keeping the current stuff running. And that's called maintenance. Most of you are dug in pretty deep. And often you have your best people just trying to keep the lights on. So you want to do all this shiny new data science stuff, but often your best talent is stuck keeping the current stuff running. So you say, well, I'll just hire uh, one of the consulting companies to do my shiny new stuff. So you outsource your shiny new stuff. You have your internal talent just keeping the lights on. This is a catch-22 that is going to fail for sure. Your maintenance is boring. Outsource that to Palantir so that you can put your best talent on your shiny new stuff. So your shiny new stuff is your secret sauce. That's what's going to win over the next decade or two. And don't outsource it to the other guys because you need internal talent uh, to win the coming arms race. So I'm not a big fan of outsourcing your shiny new stuff. Okay, blunder, no, oh, so. So what to do about this catch-22? So first of all, what I said was outsource anything you can that's boring. For sure, outsource email. All the stuff that's just random crap, uh, outsource all of that and free up your best talent uh, to work on your new stuff and cancel your Palantir contract. Okay, blunder number 10. Uh, this is one I really love, Succumbing to the Innovator's Dilemma. You should all read a book by uh, Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. At this point, it's about 10 years old. Read it once a year indefinitely. Because uh, what, this, what this basically says is that if you're an enterprise and you're keeping your current customers happy, chances are you're going to get blindsided by new technology, and that's going to wipe you out. And so their example in the book comes from steam shovels. Uh, back in the 40s, steam shovels were these big cable things with these big buckets, and they dug big things. And the customers of big digs loved steam shovels. The problem with steam shovels is they had these cables that were controlling uh, lifting the bucket. And if the cable broke, you know, it flew all over everywhere, and people got killed. 
So cable steam shovels did big jobs well, but they were dangerous. So what came along was hydraulics, and hydraulics were wildly safer. You know, if things failed, the, the shovel just kind of slowly goes to the ground. They were much safer, but they only did small digs. So the big dig people said their customers didn't want hydraulics. They wanted big things. So what happened was there was a new market for the hydraulics digging little holes, like trenches from the street uh, to a new house for water lines. So hydraulics were much safer, but low payload. And so guess what happened? Hydraulics got better, and small jobs became medium jobs, became big jobs, and so the payloads increased and hydraulics were much safer, so they won. And the cable vendors of cable steam shovels went out of business, got replaced by a new generation of technology using hydraulics. So remember this example, there's a bunch of, other in, a bunch of others in Christensen's book. If you are sitting on your laurels, chances are your market is gonna get eaten by somebody else. So the net-net is you have to be willing to eat your current business with new technology, reinvent yourself, and you may lose customers in the process. Otherwise, you go out of business in the long run. Just remember Uber and Lyft eating taxi companies. So I might just remind you that right now, across the river in Cambridge, there are taxi licenses for the, that allow you to operate a cab in Cambridge. Uh, a few years ago, they were worth 700,000. Now they're worth 10K going on zero. So a new competitor comes into your market and eats your lunch. And if you're not always terrified of this, then chances are you're gonna get eaten. So that means, brings me to your bonus blunder. If you are not, if you're working for a company that's not terrified of getting their lunch eaten uh, by new competitors, if you're not trying to do something about the sins of the past, then you have two options. One is you can be part of the solution or you can be part of the problem. So you should be trying to fix it so that your company becomes more competitive in the future. If you're interested in data science, that means solving the high pole in the tent, which is your data integration problem. Uh, if your company's not trying to reinvent itself, you should be looking for a new employer because uh, the startups are going are to eat your lunch. That is the end of my slides. Here's an advertisement for the next talk. Thank you very much.